Oh, so what a privilege to be here today. Well, there are 68 words in the miraculous prayer that I'm going to be talking about today, and it can raise the resonance of the world and it, of love. It raises the resonance of love in the world, and it raises it in us. Greg Braden said something. Do you all know who Greg Braden is? Okay, I went to hear him very, just not too long ago, and he was saying that prayer and meditation creates a high coherence. He has been working with an organization called HeartMath. Have you heard of HeartMath? All right. Oh, you're all so aware. And like <laughs> anyway, um, he, they have been studying some equipment with sensors that prove that high coherency is the outcome where prayer and meditation takes place. Coherence means separate parts coming together or fitting together to form a harmonious or a credible whole. So our prayers become global coherence because the earth is a living field and it responds to the vibration of its inhabitants. So the vibration, so we are, con we are continually having an effect on our world. So the Lord's Prayer, when we say it consciously, affects the universe and it, it affects the occupants. Just think this prayer, you know, when you think about it, it was masterfully given to us by one that loves us. And he knew that this prayer would go down through the ages to lift us to a place of unity, forgiveness, and kingdom consciousness. He knew it could shift us from instability and separation to peace. Every time we say it, and this is something that really is so astounding, but every time we say this Lord's Prayer, we are joining a large global chorus, multitudes of voices in many language, races, countries are praying this prayer. Right now, at this very moment, people all over the world are saying the prayer. Maybe prisoners, presidents, moms, dads, business executives, people are saying the Lord's Prayer at this very moment. When I was growing up in Lethbridge, Alberta, Canada, we started every day with a rushed, mumbled Lord's Prayer. And um, I was usually thinking about the boy across the room or what I would be doing after school. I will tell you the truth. I don't think I ever once thought about what I was saying. Tell me the truth. Did you when you said it in school? No. So even as an adult, I didn't. I, it just kind of went in one ear and out the other when I was stuck in some group that was saying the Lord's Prayer. It made no impact on me at all. And it was, um, it was like I was blind, and most of us are, to the glory and the guidance that's in this prayer. A few years ago, the prayer made a tremendous impact on me. I was going through rather a desperate time. Each time I come here, I'm always telling you about some desperate time that I went through. And so <clears throat> what I did is I took everywhere. I knew that it was some kind of a secret code, this Lord's Prayer. So I pondered on it, and I looked up every single word in the Greek. And um, I came out with some very interesting information. I actually have a book back there, and, and I'm just going to be giving you a little bit on each line of the prayer today, but there's a whole chapter on each line back there. And it, um, I would meditate upon every word, and I began to meet others uh, who had had similar experiences with, prayer, uh, with that prayer, and they'd had miracles happen. They shared with me how family relationships had been restored. They told me about experiences they had with physical healing and emotional healing. And they 
it wasn't when they repeated the, repa- the prayer, they just said the prayer, but it's when they began to say it contemplatively. One woman I know, she'd had insomnia for years and years, and uh, she began to say that prayer contemplatively, pondering every line of the prayer, and she said, it gave me such a feeling of security, and she said it was then I found that before I could even uh, finish the prayer, I was asleep. Now, <clears throat> the hour in our Father embraces us all as being one family. No one is left out of that family. Every barrier of race and creed and breed and class and denomination and gender is broken with the word our. You know, it's shocking to me, and I thought about it, I used to think about it a lot, how Jesus would give us such a prayer addressing us all as the hour. When most of us know that some others can't possibly be a part of the hour that we are a part of. Come on, you know. Anyway, you probably met people today, maybe they're even in your family, and you think, I don't think they're a part of my hour. But Jesus said, there's one God and there's one Father who is in all and he's through all and he's in you all. That settles it. We are all in the same hour of our Father. Now, the word Father is extraordinary. In the Greek, it's pater. And it means, lots of things this means. I'm telling you that one word, Father, it means provider, protector, upholder, nourisher, creator, the source of illumination physically and spiritually, teacher, the originator of the family, and one who animates us with the same spirit as himself. This is big. What does it mean that God animates us with the same spirit as himself and then provides illumination for us physically and spiritually? It's incredible. I mean, that is, you just say, our Father from from now on, and I hope some of that comes back to you. This means that God, being peace and love and spirit and wisdom, all intelligence, is what we are truly animated with. That's actually our identity. Jesus said, I and my Father are one. To show us the immutable union that is God's life as our life. Those two words, our Father, can remind us that whoever comes into our consciousness is being spiritually and physically animated and illuminated by God. It's, it's tremendous, really. I've had people call me for prayer, and sometimes that was the only thing that I could come up with was our Father. And I would just think... And and there would be a settling inside of me that all was well, and I'd receive a call that, sure enough, because it's so powerful. I was in a crowded mall not long ago, and I looked out, and you do this sometime. It's, It's really wonderful. And I heard resounding within me, Our Father. And I felt such gratitude and such love for everyone I was looking at. I felt so connected. You can do this when you're stuck in traffic on the King George Highway or (laughs) in Vancouver and know that you are having an effect on your world. The next line is, which art in heaven? And heaven means elevation. It means power, eternity, and it means the abode of God. So which art in heaven tells us that there is no cosmic distance between our Father God and ourselves? And I love this. Ephesians 2, 6 says that we have been raised up together. In, and we've been raised up in heavenly places in Christ. So that means we've been raised up in consciousness. So it isn't like Christ's there and we're here. It's like we have been raised up. Hallowed be thy name is the next one. 
and name means God's nature and authority. As I know the character and the authority of God, I am consequently knowing more of my own birthright and my own identity and the identity and the inheritance of God's people. You know, it was very interesting <clears throat> how many people have experienced healing by saying, in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, you're healed. That's what the disciples did. That's what they would do. They'd go around and they'd say, in the name of Jesus Christ, get up and walk. Because that name held such authority and so much healing. The next one is, thy kingdom come. And this is pretty exciting because kingdom is royalty, it is realm, it is sovereign, it's a foundation of power. And Jesus said, neither shall they say, lo there, or lo there, for behold, the kingdom of God is within you. So there's a place within us that is a realm of royalty. There's a place within us that is a foundation of power. Jesus also said, Fear not, little flock. It is my Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. The next one might be my most favorite line, and it is, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. I love this transforming line of the prayer. I have worked for years with this prayer, and I would take one line and I would work with it for the day. And some time back, a woman invited me to her home. And she immediately broke down and told me that her home was possessed by goats and ghosts. Goats? <laughs> I don't know which would be worse, goats or ghosts. But anyway, um, it was... Um, <clears throat> anyway, it was possessed by ghosts and entities. And they were literally throwing things around her house. And uh, she was scared. Her foster daughter was despondent. And she said, could you help me? And I just wanted to really tell you the truth. I just wanted to get out of there and leave her with her ghosts and um, her entities. But I had been working with that one line of the prayer, so I did something so spontaneous. If I would have put any thought into it, I never would have done it. I would have thought, what would she think? And um, do you know how much of life we miss because we're worried about what are people going to think? Yeah, you know that. So anyway, but I just leaped up out of my chair and I started yelling and screaming, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. I'm even under her bed yelling this. <laughs> and uh, <clears throat> so anyway, um, I just um, continued until the house felt better. And... Um, so anyway, it felt better, and, and then I um, stopped, and she wrote me a letter a couple of days later. Uh, no, she called me. She called me a couple of days later, and she said, I have to tell you that my entire house feels different. My daughter's no longer despondent. She said, it's amazing. So I'm seeing that, and I will tell you the truth. I was not even sure that maybe, I knew it felt different when I left, but I didn't know that would last. I thought she could possibly call me the next day and have me come and do it again. But it seemed to have lasted. And that the thing that is so exciting about that is you're just decreeing a thing as it's established. We're doing it all the time. We're decreeing sometimes lack and limitation, and it's established, right? But you decree the truth, and that truth is established. And there's something about the Lord's Prayer that when you decree that, you're decreeing something very powerful that other people are decreeing at the same time. Anyway, <clears throat> another woman received a call to pray. I get a lot of, I've got testimonies. I can't tell you, I've got stacks of testimonies of people, because I've spoken on the Lord's Prayer before, of people who have uh, shared stories with me as to the miracles that have happened. So this woman was sharing that. She received a, uh, a call from a friend and he'd had a massive heart attack. And he was being taken to the hospital. And uh, when they got him there, he wasn't expected to live the night. So she had been asked to pray. And she prayed like she had never prayed in her life. But it was the Lord's Prayer because inside of her, she heard 
pray the Lord's Prayer. So she's praying the Lord's Prayer, and she said, when I got to the part that God's will be done on earth as it is in heaven, she said, I had such a revelation that God's reality for my friend was that he be complete and that he be whole. And she said, I I just left it alone. I knew that, that the work was done, and he recovered completely. I personally believe that because this is Jesus' prayer, that as we utter it with awareness and honoring it for the glory and power that is within it, that we access Jesus and hosts of angels to bring about a higher revelation of kingdom life. I know it is a realm of manifestation, and that is why there's so many miracles that happen when we say the Lord's Prayer, especially when we're really saying it consciously. It puts us in touch with that divine blueprint that is our life, for our life. The wisdom of God is encoded in the semantics of the Lord's Prayer. The next line is give us this day our daily bread. It means, and bread means, in the Greek, I looked all these words up, bread means substance and sustenance. So Christ, as our bread of life, dwells within us to nourish, to provide, to satisfy us, to forgive, to impart truth, and love us and those he brings to us. A woman that I knew in Fort Worth, Texas, was in the hospital from a very serious uh, car accident that had almost taken her life. And she cried out in anguish. It was a very, very, very terrible car accident. And she wasn't expected to live. And she cried out to God in anguish because she had a little boy, 10 years old. She didn't want to leave. And uh, she cried out, God, just, just help me, and I need you desperately. And the words that she got was, lay your hands on your body and pray the Lord's Prayer. And she prayed this prayer, she just prayed this for several days. And she recovered within a week, and the doctors and the family were so amazed. And she said, you know, when I prayed, um, Give me this day our daily bread. She said, I knew that Christ's substance and sustenance was healing my body. The next line is, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Forgive means to forsake, to lay aside, to pardon, dismiss, omit, to free fully, and to release. Notice the word us. Remember, there's our and there's us. So it's not just my debts, but it's a broad reference to our debts. We are asking for the revelation of God's forgiveness for everyone. Unforgiveness is a blockage to God's love. And we might want to do an inventory. I've done this many times. If I'm resentful, I don't like that feeling. I want to stay in joy because it's so much more fun. And if I find that my whole vibration or my frequency is falling down, I sure don't want to stay there because we are exuding it out into the world and we're we're expecting the world to be kind to us and love us. How can they? We're exuding all this out and we're projecting that out. So I just take an inventory and I sit down and I... Um, you know, wish for these people well, and I just, I love them, and I just, I pray until I can get back into um, that wonderful place of, of joy. Forgiveness is essential to living in God's kingdom. I met a woman by the name of Joan uh, a few years ago after I'd spoken in her church, and I told, and she told me how she was brought back to life through the Lord's Prayer. She said, I was living in such fear and hatred. She said, I I was hurting people, and they were hurting me, and I had such unforgiveness in my heart. And she said, one morning I cried out, Oh, God, I need you desperately. 
and I need you now. And within a short time, it felt like a mantle of love was over me, she said. And I heard, and I went to sleep, but when I awoke, I heard the Lord's prayer was actually being prayed inside of me. And I'd hear that prayer 24 hours a day. I would wake up in the night, and I would hear it. And it felt like I was being washed and cleansed of all that hatred and that unforgiveness, and it felt like healing for every area of my life was taking place. She said, when I was a child, I'd memorized that prayer, and yet here it came back in such power when I needed it. And she said, the prayer taught me how to accept the kingdom life, how to live in love. Uh, It taught me about forgiveness and the importance of forgiving my enemies. It led me out of temptation, delivered me from evil, and let me witness his glory and his power. The next line is, and lead us not into temptation. Now, it's very interesting, but the Aramaic text of that says, do not let us enter into temptation, which I think is a little better translation. Jesus told his disciples, pray that you enter not into temptation. I always think of temptation as seeing that I'm separated from God and acting that out. Don't you think? I mean, that's just, that's always when we get into trouble is when we feel separated from God. The next line is, deliver us from evil. And the Greek meaning of evil is quite amazing. It is malice, mischief, guilt. Guilt, did you hear that? So when you're experiencing lots of guilt, you can stop and say, this is evil. I'm not going to accept it any longer. Okay? And then we get guilty, and then we feel like we have to please everybody, and that's not fun. We want to please them spontaneously, not because we're guilty. And then it means uh, grievous harm, lewd, wicked, and disease. So if we pray the prayers, we... <laughs> We are to come into the faith that we, every day of our life, we are delivered from everything that evil is. We're secure in our Father with his will being done on earth as it is in heaven. So our eyes and our mind is on God. It is not on the temptation. It's not on the appearance of evil. It's on God. Now, the last line of this prayer is, For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever. Amen. And it's so thrilling because it's an amazing way to end this prayer. We're reminded again that we are in God's kingdom and that it is within us. The power here is the Greek word dunonymous. And it means miraculous power, ability, abundance, mighty strength. This is telling us that there is only one power, and that power is God. Do you not know how many times in a day we can be fighting different powers? You know, this and that, and, and, and basically there's one power. And when we come into that revelation, we have peace. Romans 13.1 says, there is no power but of God. And then it says, the Lord God, omnipotent, reigneth. We cease to be tempted now to believe in powers outside of God's omnipotence. Just a few days ago, my friend Ellen uh, was sharing with me about her miraculous story of the Lord's Prayer. She was 14. This was in 1943 when her uh, experience happened. And she was in Norway. And she said, I was uh, 14 years old, and there was little food, and my dad sent me to live with a farmer and his wife in the next town because they had plenty of food that they had grown. The farmer was active in the underground and had gathered weapons and ammunition. There was a young boy that they had also taken in, and this young boy was having a problem with the farmer one day, and he ran away, and he told the Germans 
that this farmer had all this ammunition and he had all these guns. And the Germans came, there was, this young girl said, there, it looked like there was a hundred of them. And she uh, saw all this noise outside and there were bullets that were coming in through her door where she was. She was terrified and she was in the room with a 12-year-old girl who had been hungry also and had come to live with a farmer and his wife. Without thinking, Ellen threw this girl down and threw herself on top of her to protect her, and she said, immediately, the Lord's Prayer came to me. And she said, the peace that that gave me was just incredible. It gave me such peace, and it gave me faith. And when I came to that part, for thine is the kingdom, the power, she said, even as a young child, I knew that God had more power than 100 German soldiers. She said, I knew that. So nothing happened to her. She, uh, the Germans stayed in that house for several days, and she said it was amazing. She said, I had so much confidence. Um, you know, they kind of yelled at her and told her to prepare her some food, prepare them food, and she said, there's too many of you. You're going to have to help me. And she started giving them directions. She had one peel potatoes and another one do this. And she kind of took over. And she said, it's because I just, I knew. I just knew about God's love for me and God's love for them. And she said, that's the key right there, is to see the love for your enemy. And that's what that prayer had told her, to forgive these debts. And to, as she had been forgiven... The last word is glory, and it's so wonderful. I love this word glory. It's uh, splendor, dignity, honor, it's beautiful, and it's glorious. And all of those attributes have been breathed into our soul. We are animated with these qualities, and um, that's, um, and, and forever. It ends with forever, so we are forever animated with those qualities. So in closing, as you become more acquainted with the Lord's Prayer, I promise you that you will become more intimately acquainted with the one who gave the prayer. Thank you. I'm going to... Um... <laughs> Thank you. I'm going to have our meditation now. And I'm going to do the Greek rendition of the Lord's Prayer. Let us just be still now, very still, and let's enter into that secret place of the Most High. And in this secret place of the Most High, there is no worry, there's no anxiety, and there is no unforgiveness. We're entering into the abiding place where God is all in all. And we pray our protector, our teacher, our nourisher. You are our source of illumination and you animate us with your spirit. You have raised us up to abide in an eternal, celestial, elevated place of power called heaven. This is where we know your character and your authority to be sanctified, holy love. You are omnipresent. 
omnipotent, and omniscient. And you impart us with your very life. Your kingdom that abides in us is sovereign. It is a realm of light and a foundation of power, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. Your purpose and pleasure are fulfilled and performed in us on earth as it is in heaven. You magnify your life in us and you bestow upon us this day your consciousness and this bread of life sustains us. As we ask to be forgiven, we know the truth, and that truth sets us free. We realize we've been released and pardoned, and we release our debtors that have harmed us. You lead us away from adversity and the temptation to believe that we are separate from you. You are the royal realm of sovereignty, abundance, and miraculous power. Your glory is here now, forever, and so it is. Amen.